because it really is a book that, and, and we don't want to isogee, we don't want to press our opinion down the scripture, we want to exegete, we want to let the scripture read itself out because it knows what it's about. The thing I like about James is that he does the exegetical work for us, but he also does the application phase of this because he says, here's what you need to do and here's how you do this. And so that's going to make it a little bit easier to study. Uh, this is chapter one that we're beginning in tonight, and chapter one is about 27 verses. What I'm going to do is attempt, this is sort of format, I think we're going to do about 30 minutes time, take about a five minute break, bring on into break there, and then we'll come back and finish up in the next 30 or, or 35 minutes. And, uh, and this will probably be the longest session because of the number of verses in the chapter, and it just takes a little time to cover all of that. How real is your religion? A New England teacher quizzed a group of college-bound high school juniors and seniors, and the answers they gave were just absolutely astounding. Uh, ought to be alarming to us as well. Among the unusual answers from those students, Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers, they said. Jezebel was Ahab's donkey. Other students thought the New Testament gospel was written by Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. And uh, Eve was created from an apple. Jesus was baptized by Moses. Sounds like a chapter right out of Waters World if you've ever seen the chapter. Yes. <laughs> uh, the answer that really took the prize was uh, given by one of the top guys. He's in the top 5% of the class. The question was, what is Golgotha? Or in the Greek, Golgotha. Uh, we know, of course, that's the place of the skull uh, for crucifixion. And his answer was, that it was the name of the giant who slew David. So, <laughs> kind of reminds us that we're living in the 21st century and most people are biblically illiterate. And they don't really know what the Bible teaches. Great debates, much, much discussion today about what is true religion, what's genuine religion, what kind of religion should I follow? And it's not just about anymore about being Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, and so forth. Really, the issue today is, is, is the competition between the Christian faith and, or I shouldn't say competition, but that's the way they see it, I think, and, and really, we are competing with souls of people. And we're talking about the Christian faith and the world religions and cults, and there are a lot of those in the world today. Uh, I believe that we Christians have the truth in God's word. The problem is that we, have, we're, we haven't lived the truth as maturing people of God, and as a result of that, there's a disparity between what we say we believe and that, that God saves us. Why does he save us and leave us in the world? Why not just save us and snipe us out of here? Why not, you know, we, we go through a lot of struggles and trials and frustration. Born again, you're gone to heaven instantly. Doesn't do it that way. He leaves us here. So he leaves us here for some purpose. He's working on maturing us and shaping us to live and act more and more like Jesus Christ until he comes. In this election season, it seems like all the politicians have sort of brought, in, brought, uh, brought into the world's lie that people and position, possessions, power, bring peace and purpose to life. But if you listen to them, you find out that all they're really talking about is the, are the things that will produce emptiness in us. We're making all kinds of outlandish promises uh, to one another in this kind of season. I mean, you know, I, I listen to some of them like they promise, they're promising like they could deliver it. I mean, you listen to both parties. It's, it's unbelievable to me. Uh, things that will cost uh, tremendous amounts, and they say this will produce peace or joy, things are not the answer. A new program is not the answer. And we know what the answer is. We know from experience that religion is not the answer. Too much religion we have with too little relationship with Jesus Christ in our world today. And so real religion is a relationship with Christ, and that's what differentiates us as Christian people from the rest of the world religions. Other religions will be around when Jesus comes, and because religion is man's quest to reach up to God, there are a lot of people who are trying to do that, and these people are following ISIS and some of these other um, off-the-wall things that are happening in the world today. Uh, what, what is happening is that people are buying into those things, thinking they can somehow reach up to God. They're going to go to heaven and have the promise of whatever and whichever when they get on the other side. While Christianity is God's saying, I've come down to man, and, uh, and, and I'm going to live among men, 
in the person of Jesus Christ and then give that life that I've come to display for you to uncover myself to you and show myself to you. And now I want to leave you with what it takes to develop a maturing relationship with my son who died for you. And that's by the inspiration of God's Spirit. So God wants to use our life experiences to equip us to live in the world that we live in today. Spiritually mature people in the 21st century is what God needs. We, God needs more of us who have grown up in our faith. The problem is that we have been so influenced by the world that the world sees this big disparity between what we say we believe and what we actually live. And we need to, to clarify that. So that's why we're studying in the book of James. James gives us a greeting. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to study right through chapter 1. And I'm using the whole Christian Standard Bible, the, the Bible of choice in our congregation. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes of the desperation. Greetings, he says. Now, four men in the New Testament named James, John's brother, the son of Zebedee, one of those. Um, also, Alpha's son, the father of Judas, named James, and James, the Lord's brother. I believe it was James, Jesus' brother, who wrote the book. He was a deeply spiritual person who came to Christ late in his life. He didn't really come to Christ when Jesus was around home and they were you know, having the discourse of the family. He came to Jesus later. It took the, the crucifixion and the resurrection to get there for James. But James became a very uh, devout, uh, deeply spiritual person and very rose to leadership in the Jerusalem church, as a matter of fact. He calls himself here a doulos, or doulos, and that's, that means a bond slave of God and Christ. And uh, that's important for us to remember because bond slave is a significant thing. He was saying, I'm the property of God. I belong to God. And so he was bought with the price. What does the scripture say? We're not our own, but we're bought with the price. Mm -hmm. And what was the price? Christ yes, was yes. shed for us, death yes. on the cross. So, and notice that James uses here in this first verse three names for Jesus Lord Jesus Christ. As Lord, he was the owner. As Jesus, he was the Savior, the Redeemer. And as Christ, he was the Anointed One. He was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So James introduces himself in this unusual way to kind of tell us that to tell us who he is, that he has a personal relationship with God. Now that should get us in tune with him because he says, I've got a relationship with God. I'm going to tell you how to mature in your faith. And, and we call this a wisdom book. It is the New Testament wisdom book, a companion, I think, to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The Old Testament book of Proverbs is a wisdom book. James is a wisdom book in the New Testament. So after introducing himself, James begins to discuss how we can mature in our faith and how we can deal with trials uh, and circumstances that are difficult for us to face in life. So he says we have a choice. And the choice is... We are either growing or grumbling, and that's what he's going to discuss in verses 2 through 12. He gets right into the subject of how we can, can achieve Christian maturity, and he says that the, there is a right way, and, that, and, and if you do it the right way, you'll be on a firm foundation. If you do it the wrong way, you'll be immature for, for the rest of your Christian walk. And so how can we become mature and live maturely in the 21st century? He says we have to develop stamina through the circumstances of life. Now, what does, God, what does God's strength training look like? I want you to uh, jot down if you want to in your notes that God's strength training involves tests. That's important for us to remember. God's strength training involves tests. I'm talking here about trials, times when the wheels come off of it for us, times when the circumstances get rough. Uh, when we face those kind of times, we either grow or we grumble. Now, let's just look at this and give it just a moment for you to, to share some thoughts here. Uh, what kind of test would you say he's talking about? What kind of test do we walk? What kind of test have you been through? What kind of test do we walk through in life that are tough times, trials? Okay. Sickness. Yes, that's one. Yes, ma'am. Kids, what yes. they're going Maturing children and then marriages, and it doesn't yeah. end. It never ends. Never. Mm -hmm. no. Two sons, and this is one of them running the PowerPoint. My wife's standing there. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, we got two sons and uh, five. We and and in their family's got five grandkids, all of them boys. 
And it, there's, there's, never, there's never an end to, there, there's always excitement, there's always something going, always challenges going on. So we have relational tests. You know, we, people go through divorce, uh, remarriage, uh, people go through the loss of job and career. So that's a test. I don't know how many people in my ministry that I've had to, to do lengthy counseling experiences with trying to help them through the circumstances of their lives because they lost a job. One day somebody just says, don't need you anymore, and you, you've been devoted to the company for 25 years, near retirement. Um, sometimes we, we're not in the right job. you know. So we, we're looking for it. I always said, particularly preachers, always think they're serving beneath their potential. I used to have preacher friends come to me all the time because I pastored a large church, they were in smaller churches, and they were always saying, could you recommend me over here or over there? And I was like, let the Holy Spirit do that. <laughs> I never wanted my name on a recommendation for someone I didn't know well. So, so we have those kind of experiences in our careers. Financial tests, physical tests that uh, our friend mentioned there. Uh, temptations, how many times we give in to temptation? Look back across your life. How many times have you said yes when you should have said no? Uh, said no when you should have said yes? We all have experienced that kind of thing. So where do those tests come from? I think tests always come from God either through his intentional will or his permissive will. Mm -hmm. Tests come from God through his intentional will or his permissive will. So James is arguing here that God is our instructor. God's the one who's running the class. So he's the one that's giving the test. Now let me get you to jot down because you need to make sure you, you catch this. The devil tempts, God tests. The devil means some, some things for tempting, and God uses the same thing for tests. For example, uh, with Job in the Old Testament, he said, give me access to God, give me access to Job, and God says, I'll give you limited access to him so that you can tempt him. And at the same time, God gave him that limited access to him, and God was testing him through that same experience. The devil tests him to prove him false, God tests him to prove him false, God tests him to prove him true. So we will either grow or grumble in that circumstance. So James says, let me tell you how you can deal with these tests, these trials. First of all, he gives us the prospect of how to deal with them, and that is joy. He says, consider it all a great joy, my brother, whenever you experience various trials. That's in, in verse 2. So he says, these tests, these trials, are going to come to us. He uses a Greek word there uh, that is perosmos. Uh, Drosmos, and that, that means a test or trial or temptation. Now, God can send them either through his permissive or his ideal will, as we've seen, but James says, and he uses another word here, poikilos, and that means the trials or tests are many colored or various diverse trials. So he says God's going to lay all kinds of different trials on you. If you want to mature in your faith, if you don't want to mature in your faith, then you can ignore that and do nothing about it and stay as immature as you want to. But if you want to grow in your faith, these trials, these tests are inevitable, and these are for your growth. Now, 1 Peter 1, 6, Peter says the same thing. He says, you rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials. And that's that same word uh, that James used uh, when he said, for kilos or many colored, or various kinds of trials. Mm -hmm. James says when all these different kinds of trials and tests come, he says we ought to react to them with joy. Now he, he doesn't say we ought to be all happy and thrilled jumping up and down and kicking our feet together when we're going through a tough time. And I don't think he's even trying to be preaching with these people because he, he, he sees them as fellow strong. He calls them my brothers. <clears throat> His goal is to mature us. And you see, there's one thing. God doesn't want us just to be happy. Circumstances can cross up your happiness, but they ought not to ever cross up your joy. Because who is our joy? Christ is. If Christ is our joy, we haven't lost him in the middle of the trial. He's still there. So James says we should count it all joy when we're in the middle of these trials. And so joy comes not by escaping, but by living through the test. James says you want to get really happy. You want to have joy in your heart and life. Live through the test. These trials are external he's talking about here, the kinds of things we've been talking about. Now, later on in the chapter, he's going to talk about internal th uh, trials or tests, which are really temptations we're going to talk about. But God is out to mature our faith. You want to jot that down because that's a, an extremely important 
concept that James gives to us. God wants to mature us. Now, muscles grow by doing what? You want to build your muscles up, what do you do? Exercise. Uh, exercise, lift weights, that's right. And some of us work out from time to time. I, I was over at the gym this morning. I do, I run three days and work out at the gym three days. And I was over at the gym working out this morning, and I saw some people in the gym today who looked at me as if they must have said before they went to the gym, oh boy, it's gym day. <laughs> oh my, you gotta go to the gym. But James says, we live weakly and die sadly if we do not respond to the trials and tests that God gives us because that's God's training program, God's exercise program. So we just want, uh, we just want to be removed from the trials. What, what, do you, what does our prayer sound like? We get in the midst of a trial or a test. First thing we do is pray, God, could, just, could this be over quickly? Could you just remove me from this? God, I want to escape from this. I don't want to go through this. Could you, could, could you help us? No. He says, we, we should count it all joy when we fall into God's exercise program. So what he says is that we should have joy. Now the question comes to my mind, if he wants me to have joy in the midst of trials, tell me how to do that. And he does that for us. In verses 3 and 4, he begins to tell us, here's the plan. Recalling what we know is the first step. Look what he says. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You already know that, he says. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Paul had said the same thing, of course, in Romans 5, 3, when he said, and not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. And so that makes it even more plain for us. When we pray for patience, let me show you what we're really praying for. When we ask God to make us more patient in the circumstances of our lives, we're, we're, what, what produces the, the patience? It comes through, we are patient in order to get greater endurance. So when we pray for patience or endurance and want to be more mature, we're asking for God to give us testing and affliction. So James says that's the way it comes. It comes through testing. If you go through the trial, the test, that produces patience and brings to maturity. Oh, you say, well, but wait a minute. In James 1, 3, James says testing produces endurance. Yes, trials work for us. That's what he says. The trial is there to grow us up. The trial is there to exercise our faith. Therefore, our maturity. They're there for our completion. That's God's goal for us. His plan for us is to make us complete. The word is teleos. Or teleos, and that means complete or finished or full grown. God doesn't want to just save us and leave us immature through all of our lives. He wants to save us and he wants to exercise us through the test of life so that we will become more mature, more nearly perfect, more nearly complete. So tests are to mature us in Christ. When the Bible says that we may be perfect, what does the Bible mean by be perfect? I read a little quote from one guy who said, no one can live above sin unless he has a room over a nightclub. I guess he'll be living above sin. Uh, but James doesn't mean sinless here. What he means is mature. Uh, you, I could take a flower here at springtime and the beautiful flowers all over everywhere. Take a flower and hold it up and say, this is a perfect flower. Or we, you know, I, I always, many times through the ministry, went to the hospital and kids were born and I'd always be there and pray with the parents after the birth of a child. And, and even with a large church, I, I enjoyed doing that as part of the ministry. I've married many of them to one another. I was enjoying celebrating with them the first child being born and children thereafter. Would go, they always wanted me to hold the child. I had to hold the child. And then, you know, it wasn't a selfie thing so much as it was. They wanted to take a picture of me with the baby. And say, so the preacher was here. You know, the preacher held our child. And I had to pray over the child, which was a, a, a ministry in itself, which was a blessing. But, you know, but I always had to say, it's such a perfect, beautiful baby. And I, and I said, you know. I, I'm caught now. If, if I, either I'm going to lie, because <laughs> I tell you, sometimes babies are not perfect. At the of the but uh, so we say that, we, and, and and then we expect one to become mature uh, after that birth. We expect the flower is beautiful, and we say it's perfect. We don't mean perfection, but we mean it's come to maturity, and a child is coming to maturity uh, as he grows up or she grows up. A good example, the oak tree. You plant an acorn, and what happens? You have an oak tree. Oak trees come from acorns. When you uh, are discouraged and feel a little blue, uh, one person said, take a look at a mighty oak tree and see what a nut can do. <laughs> uh, an oak tree is the, is the perfection of an acorn, the maturing of an acorn, and that's exactly true. A little acorn becomes a big oak tree. 
little Christian, beginning Christian, baby Christian, becomes a full-grown Christian, a complete person in Christ. And that's what James says. We endure through trials. We make our way through trials. And faith is like gold. It stands the test of fire. And so faith endures even in life's furnace experiences. I think about the Hebrew children. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there they are in the fire, the fiery furnace. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is, you know, thinks he's going to extinguish them. And who appears in the midst? Christ himself in the midst of them and walks with them. He didn't, look, those guys didn't ask, hey, get us out of here, get us out. No, Jesus says, hey, I'm here to walk with you. He didn't take them out of the fire. He walked with them through the fire. And not one hair on their heads was singed the result of their being in the furnace. So when we're walking through the fiery furnace of life, through the trials and struggles of life, through the tests of life, God is more interested in our maturity, our completeness in Christ, than he is in our comfort. And he says, I'm going to let you go through this so that I can make you more complete. Now, our salvation, I believe, occurs in three tenses. Past tense, regeneration, that's the new birth. That's the theological word, but regeneration is talking about the new birth. We're born again by faith in Christ. We're in th then the sanctification, which is another theological term. That just simply means we, we, we have been saved already, regeneration or new birth. We are being saved, sanctification, or, or God's cutting off the rough edges is the way I like to see that. You take a picture that's made for an 8 by 10 frame, it's always got a selvage edge on. You have to cut off the rough edges to be able to fit it in the frame. And so God has stamped the image of Christ on each of us as we came to him in faith. And he says, now I'm going to cut off the rough edges through these trials and circumstances of life. And I'm going to make you more and more like Jesus, more and more mature every day until Jesus comes. Then we'll be just like him, which is the final theological term, which is glorification. That's future tense. So we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved is, is what we're seeing here. So if we combine the teachings of James 1, 3, and 4, and Paul's statement of Romans 5, 3, and 5, here's what we learn. Faith uh, produces testing. We do that with joy. We have endurance. So we develop patience, and then we develop maturity, and that brings character, and then that produces hope in our lives. And that's the way we are maturing. And so the trials are faced with joy, and if they are, they're infused with faith and endurance results, completeness. You say, well, boy, that sounds great, but that's an unattainably lofty goal. And that's, that's I don't know how, tell us how in the world we're going to be able to do that. Well, apparently James here said the same thing. Because he answers the question in verse 5, because here is the promise. We've seen the plan. Here's the promise. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives all to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. I believe he's telling us that God gives will give us assistance in achieving the goal that he's given to us. And how is God going to do that? God gives will give us Sophia, that is wisdom, the, the Greek term for wisdom, for life, if we ask him, he says, just ask for wisdom to deal with the trial. Don't pray for God to take you out of it. Don't fuss because you're going through it. Don't get angry with God. Don't blame somebody else. He says, just ask God and he'll give you the wisdom to deal with it. Now, knowledge is the ability to take things apart. Wisdom, and we have, by the way, we have a ton of knowledge. We, do you realize with the internet that we are just inundated? I don't care. You can Google anything you want to Google, and there's an answer of some kind. Some you don't want to hear, but, but there are answers. I, I mean, I, I don't think there's any. You, I, you can just give two or three words and misspell them, and it, and it comes up with an answer. You know, you, you can start typing your name in something, and somebody calls you. Because they already know you're on the, on the computer typing their, their information for their company, and they'll call you up on the phone. It's incredible how much knowledge we have and how much we know how to do things, and yet we don't have enough wisdom to use knowledge correctly. And so James said, I'm giving you the knowledge about how to do this. And I'm telling you, ask God to give you the wisdom to know how to apply the knowledge I'm giving. I've, I'm telling you how to walk through trials. This is the plan. Now, here is the promise that God will give you the wisdom necessary to make it happen. And so, God will show us how to use knowledge. There is a lot of knowledge around, again, as I said, but we've got to balance. Look, how many people do we know that are so brainy and so smart do almost anything? You know, you just say, to put them in a the classroom and teach and just have incredible amounts of knowledge. But give them something simple to do. You know, if there's a faucet that leaks at home, they don't know how to take it apart and put a, faucet, a washer in it and fix it. They call a plumber. Do some, I'm not saying everybody ought to be a DIY person, by the way. 
But I'm just saying that a lot of people have a lot of knowledge, but they don't balance that with the wisdom. We want to, we want to pray for strength and grace and deliverance when we ought to be praying for wisdom and not waste the opportunity that God has put in front of us when he brings a test or trial into our lives. So the, we've seen now the prospect, joy, we've seen the plan, how we do that, and the promise. Look at the prerequisites for receiving the promise. He says in verse 6 through 8, But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. And so he says there are some prerequisites. If you want this wisdom, you want to ask God for the wisdom, and you want to deal with, with the circumstances the correct way and mature, first thing you need is faith. Notice James says we're to ask with faith. God is anxious. He, he says God wants to answer. How many times, examine your prayer life for a moment, just a quick flashback. How many times have you said, God, if you could, or if you would, <laughs> or if this, or if that, or words like hopefully you could, maybe we could, maybe I can. We use those kind of terms in asking things from God. Question is, we have to look, we have to believe God's promises. I, I got involved in an interesting study a few years ago. I produced a book that I've done that's uh, for every fear of promise. Uh, and I've heard preachers say many times uh, in, in the, from the pulpit, you know, God is, is so interested in, in giving us, uh, in dealing, helping us, giving us a way to deal with fear, that he's given us a, a promise, that he's given us a word about fear, 365 fear not words in the Bible, 366, I think they say, fear not words in the Bible, one to leave here too. 366 fear not words in the Bible, so that we'll know that he's serious about helping us deal with fear. But I started researching that. They're not. There are a hundred and some odd fear not statements in the Bible, but there are many, many, not explicit, but implicit statements about it. And the more I studied that, the more I came to find that for every fear in the Bible, there's a promise. God says, if this is the fear, I promise you this to deal with it. And I found 366 different applications of that and put that in a book for every fear of promise. Not promoting the book, I'm just telling you, I, I believe that God's serious about dealing with, with uh, fear and dealing with doubt, and he wants to help us understand how to do that. And so, uh, God, uh, James says that God wants to give you the capacity, the ability, I, look, we, God wants to give you the ability to believe it. God wants to give you the faith to believe it. That's where you begin. You've got to have the faith to believe God's promises. Every promise that he gives. There are over 7,000 of them, by the way, in the scripture. And then freedom from doubt. Not only faith, he says we've got to have freedom from doubt. Uh, we say we believe God's promises, and yet our fears say we are doubtful in our minds. The NIV translates the word double-minded. It means vacillating. Uh, we're being tossed back and forth like the waves, he says. We're up one day, we're down the next. So doubt creates instability and uncertainty in our prayer life. If I don't know what I believe, if I'm not assured of what I believe, and if I'm not basing my belief on the Word of God, and my faith is not in the Bible, in the Scripture as God's authoritative Word to me, then my doubt will create instability in the way I pray. And I won't pray. I won't, I won't be bold. If you really believe the Scripture, get bold. And I always tell people, don't be timid when you come into the throne room. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Christ is interceding in heaven for you, the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know even how to pray, do like Paul and say, I don't know how to pray for as I ought. So the Holy Spirit, you utter the request for me. That's praying in the Spirit. Let, let the Spirit utter the request. And he'll always ask it correctly. We're just, he says we're like corks bobbling up and bobbing up and down on the waves. And Paul used a similar idea in uh, Ephesians 4.14. He says, Then we will no longer be little children tossed by waves, blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness, in the techniques of deceit. So if we have believing and united hearts, we can ask in faith, and God says, I'll give you the wisdom you need. See, instability and immaturity go together. Uh, I always said, if you, you know, and I've heard, heard it said many times, read the quote years ago, and it's stuck in my mind. You don't have to understand the Bible to stand on it. So you, we say, well, I don't understand that. Well, the Bible teaches that it's impossible to please God apart from faith. Some things we have to accept by faith. I always see faith 
Faith, I think, is like uh, you, you, you're running down, a, you, if you use human reason, it's like the long jump. You run down a center track, and at some point you come to a starting block, and your foot goes on the starting block, and what do you do, just stop? That's where human reason, does, that was, that's what human reason does, runs out somewhere. Human reason says, well, I can't, I can't test this anyway. I don't know how to, well, what, what picks up there? Faith does. And so you have to take the leap of faith to complete the jump. And that's the way we are in our lives. I think we come to the end of what we can understand about it. So that James says, in peace or in adversity, whatever it is, we need to start each day in the contest of life by being sure that we've flipped the coin to the upside where faith is up. And we say, I'm going to live by faith today. I'm going to, I'm going to trust in God's word. What, what God cannot bless us with is this kind of wisdom that he's talking about if we don't choose to do it by faith. He says you've got to have faith in order to have, and, and, and that produces freedom from doubt, obviously. So faith will guide us through the plays of the day. Whatever play you're running is to use a football analogy, and we run a lot of those each day. We need to do it by faith. Now verses 9 through 11, notice the profitability of living like this. He says, the, the brother of humble circumstances should boast in his exaltation, but the one who is rich should boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and dries up with the grass. Its flower falls off and its beauty, beautiful appearance is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will wither away while pursuing his activities. What are the advantages of, of obtaining this unwavering faith and, and then having unwavering faith in the test of life this is what it is. We gain high standing with God. James says you get high standing. You, you get an A plus on the test because God sent the test. Uh, whatever our standing economically, social, makes no difference uh, because he says we have high standing with God. Our circumstances here are not, may not be the best, but our circumstances in heaven will be uh, eternally rich. So Paul says the same thing again over in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He says, this momentary light affliction we're going through, he calls it light affliction. My goodness, he had been shipwrecked and snake bitten and flogged and beaten and threatened for his life and all those things. Uh, and he says, nothing can compare with, with our being made more like Jesus, our being brought finally to be just like Jesus in the end. That's what he's after. So uh, we want to be like him. That's the whole purpose of this. Now, here's the payment. If we do this, if we live, like he said, with joy and trial, if we do it the way he said, by faith and so forth, here's the payment. A man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is James 1, uh, 12. Now, I want to show you social prominence, economic wealth, position, status. James says all that's going to pass away. You, you can have it today, it'll be gone tomorrow. It'll be like a flower exposed to the scorching heat of the day. It'll wither up. When we look around, the person walks in and sits close to us in church, and that person may be poorly clothed, seem underprivileged socially. We all remember this. You know, they may not have as much here, but we are all going to be given crowns of glory. That's what James says. If we mature in our faith, uh, 1 John 3, 2, John says, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be then, we has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him, because we'll see him as he is. So we will have crowns of life. That's, that's life here and in, in spiritual fullness, and completeness in Christ, and being just like him there. So I think that what James is teaching here in verse 12 has both a present and a future application. Uh, we, we have full life now, and eternal life hereafter. Uh, so it appears that our outlook determines our outcome. If we are, if our outlook is positive and we are going through trials with joy and learning and maturing in our faith and growing, then uh, obviously um, we'll have all we need when we get to heaven. We'll have glory when we, we receive crowns of glory. Have I reached the halfway point, 6.30? Okay. Let's, do, 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 you, do, do you want to take a break or do you want me just to keep cruising here? Okay. Well, if we can just go ahead, we'll just go right on through. I, it's fine. I want to make sure that we got a long chapter here. We're going to go on through. Okay. Well, I that's right. He's not God's real right. press to go out now. <laughs> I think you're right. And just so you know, when we get up in 10 minutes, we're going to teach kids. That's fine. We're not, we're not disinterested. I understand. <laughs> I understand. 
I'm hoping the video will work if you want to take that. We'll have to, yes, sir. So verses 13 through 18, he talks about gaining victory over temptation. Verses 13 and 14, notice the origin of temptation. We've shifted gears. We've been talking about the external trials and tests of life. Now he's talking about the internal spiritual battles of life that go on because we're in a spiritual battle. In case you haven't recognized, I'm sure if you live at all, you know what I'm talking about. That the devil never rests. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week thing with him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, for he himself doesn't tempt anyone. We talked about that earlier. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. If you feel troubled by Satan, you, do you know what I'm saying when I say that Satan will trouble you? Mm -hmm. Oh, my, my goodness. You know, and how many different people and places and things and circumstances he'll use to do that? If we're not tempted, we ought to check on our spiritual temperature because he is definitely on the job. He will attack. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 6 in the disciples' prayer, I call it, the Lord's prayers in John 17, but the disciples' prayer in Matthew 6. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We need to pray about temptation, and we need to ask for deliverance through it. Uh, we, we many times want deliverance from it. God doesn't promise that. He promises deliverance through it. So we are tempted by our own evil desires is what James teaches. Where does it come from? It comes from our own evil desires prompted by Satan. Satan knows what the human flesh desires and wants and, and what we say our needs are. And so we're, he just prompts those. I like the story of a, a guy who was uh, troubled in his life and he went to see his physician and he said, Doctor, I've been misbehaving lately, so my conscience really is bothering me, so I thought I'd see you to see if you could help me. And Dr. Hess said, well, what do you expect me to do? Give you something to strengthen your willpower? He said, no, I want something to weaken my conscience. That's what most of us are. We get convicted in our conscience, we just want the conscience to go away. Just give me a while. I, you know, I, I still want to be able to do this. We, we have no strong desire to overcome temptation, but James says, when we're undergoing a trial, we shouldn't say we're being tempted by God, we want to we need to want to overcome the temptation. I can tell you this, if you don't want to overcome it, you will not overcome it. And so, why should Jesus instruct us to pray as he did, bring us not into temptation? Does that mean that God tempts us? No. We've already seen God does not tempt, and James clarifies that. God never tempts. So Jesus says, pray that God will deliver us out of it. And what it, what it, he's really saying is, don't bring us into it, deliver us out of it. That's what he's praying in his prayer. Because he knows that his father's not going to bring him into temptation, so he says, just deliver me out of temptation. Satan tries to get us to escape from the tests of life. That's one of his biggest ways to tempt us and break us down. He, he'll tempt us to do wrong things. We'll talk about that. But he also tempts us to escape the test because he knows if we go through the test and we pray for wisdom and God gives it and we mature through it, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be pushed aside because now we're going to be more and more mature in Christ and we're going to be able to withstand this temptation. So we, for example, God gives us desires, human desires. Without hunger, we wouldn't eat. Without being tired, tiredness, we wouldn't uh, uh, take uh, time for rest and, and fatigue. Without sexual desires, we wouldn't propagate the race. Why would we? There would be no uh, generation at one after the next. So Satan attempts to get us to meet our God-given needs, those desires, in ways outside of God's will. He says, you know, God wants this for you. God gave you this desire. Yeah, you meet it however. No, that's not what he says. He tempts us to give in to the temptation. And so Satan is a good chooser of bait. If he were a fisherman, he'd know the right bait to catch any kind of fish he wanted to catch. You know no bait, no fish, right? Because the bait is the exciting thing. The fish loves the bait. You can throw a bare hook in there. I have been in some places where the places have been stocked, you could throw a bare hook in and the place hit it, the fish hit it for it, it hit the water. That's incredible. But most of the time, fish are looking for the bait. And so we choose sin as our as our way out of what we would, would otherwise receive blessing for. We choose to sin. God says, you do this and you'll be blessed. We say, well, I'm going to do it a different way. And so it's like cheating on God's test. And that's what James is talking about. We don't want to cheat on his test. And so... 
He shows us then its origin. The second thing he talks about is in verses 15 and 16, its operation. How does this work? This, uh, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dearly loved brothers, he says. So here's how it operates. James says, from emotions, that is our desire, that are kindled by our desires, to intellect, now we're deceived because that's in our minds. I've always said if you, haven't, if, if you ever consent to something in your mind, you're going to do it in the flesh. Because the battle is won or lost in our minds. We don't decide at the last minute to do something. We don't just stumble into sin as if we tripped into a pothole on the street. No, we think about it and we decide to do it. That's at the end of the intellect, deception. Then our will is that we act on it. And so James says, we go from the, the bait to the birth, the, from the birth of the baby, the battle is lost in our minds, our desires conceive a method of taking the bait, we act, and then desires then conceive, sin is born and matures and produces its own offspring, which is death, he said. That's a good analogy he uses to teach us that. So if we read this genealogy, uh, he says, don't be deceived because you know what causes it. He says, you know how it operates. And so right responses to trials when we're going through the test will result in spiritual maturity, which will lead us to be mature enough not to fall to Satan's temptation and not to lose the battle in our minds. So we need to learn to live like that we are made alive in Christ. And what in Adam all are what? Dead, right? Spiritual death. But Adam and Eve, what did they do? They, they experienced the whole gamut of this. Adam and Eve experienced immediate spiritual death, separation from God when they sinned. And then they eventually experienced what? Physical death. So we experience physical death now, but since we're born spiritually, we are alive in Christ. We'll never experience. Jesus said, if you if live and believe in me, you'll never die. We just change residence. So we just go on living. We're not, we're not going to die. Verses 17 and 18, then, it's overcoming. This is how it's, it can be overcome. Every generous, verse 17 and 18, every generous act, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. With him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creatures. There's a little song sung by Amy Grant uh, that, that was a hit. It's, it's, if there's anything good that happens in my life, it's from Jesus. Some of you may have heard the song, heard the lyrics uh, of the song. That's not very deep theologically, but it is extremely true spiritually. If there's anything good, Jesus, uh, or, listen, Jesus is the giver of every perfect gift. God is the giver of every perfect gift. James says every generous act, every perfect gift. If there's anything good, it comes from Jesus. It's from him. It's by his hand. So God gives us moments, for example, we're tested, tempted. And God gives us, before we jump into the thing, God gives us a moment of hesitation. What's that hesitation for? To let us change our minds and not go through with that. Uh, so the two Greek words he uses uh, for a gift here, the first one is dosis, which uh, means the act of giving. Uh, and that's where we get our word doxology, or the, the doxology we sang, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And uh, Doces, the act of giving, then he also uses, he uses another word, that is dorema, dorema, which describes the things he gives, and that is the object of the gift. And so, God is great and God is good. That's not just phraseology in a little kid, childlike prayer. God is great in his giving. Every generous, every perfect gift comes from God. Uh, who was it? Uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, uh, being evil, then uh, how much more will your father have a good give, give good, get, good things, he says, good gifts to those who ask him. So James talks about God as the father of lights. The Bible says God put the sun and moon in place. God is the father of lights. Uh, last week I was driving home in the afternoon in the western sun on the west side of Franklin. And I'm telling you, I just blinded. I, the sun was so bright, and and I looked in the windshield. I had this, some pollen on it, and you know, stains on it, bug stains, and so forth. But I want to tell you, it didn't keep that light from coming through, and it was pure light that came through that glass in my face. And I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, you, you can take something that's dirty and nasty, you shine light on it, 
but, but the light doesn't become dirty and nasty. The light remains pure. And Jesus is the light of the world. And so, uh, if, if we want to get the darkness out of our lives, James says, you can get darkness out spiritually just like you do physically. You don't have to shovel it out, curse it out, beat it out. If you want to get the darkness out of your life, turn the light on. So James says, everything good and perfect comes from God. If you're going through these tests and trials, accept them as from God. Jesus is the light of the world that dispels the darkness in our lives. And so, what is the greatest gift of all the gifts that God has given to us? I think if you look in verses 17 and 18, we'll find a clue. We saw one clue in verse 17. Look in verse 18. Uh, it tells us exactly what it is. The verse begins by saying, Every generous act and perfect gift is from above. The from above there could be translated from again. What did Jesus, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born what? Again. Mm. Or where? From above, right? So that's, the, that's mm. the terminology that James uses. So he says that we must be born again and our birth again is from above, is from God. So Jesus then is the light of the world. And listen, the greatest gift God ever gave to you and me is eternal life. Our first birth messes us up. But the second birth is beyond repair. Uh, so uh, is, is beyond uh, deletion. It lasts forever. So by granting us new birth, God declares he can't accept the old birth. He says, I, I can't use what's from here. So you got to be born again from above. And that's James' terminology again. You think about the times in the scripture that God accepted the second born, not the first born, in scripture. So that he accepted Abel, not Cain, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. And he rejects our first birth. Uh, no matter how noble our first birth might have been, no matter how good our parents may have been, no matter how godly they may have been, he rejects that as a way to have a relationship with them. The only way to have a relationship to solve the problem is not a renovation, of the first birth, but a gift of a brand new birth is what he says. And so a brand new life. James says by his own choice, he gave us, he gave us new birth. That's the greatest gift that we ever received from him. And how does he do that? He does it by his will, he says, of his own choice. God has chosen to give us new birth uh, by the message of truth. And what is the message of truth? Where do we get the message of truth from? Uh -huh. From God, and it's in the scripture, yes. That's right. And it's God's truth about eternity, God's truth about salvation. It's the word of God. So he says he's done this that we might be the first fruits of his creatures. Now that goes back to an Old Testament image there. The farmers would grow their crops. They would take the first, uh, the sheaves, the first of the fruit or whatever it was. They would take the first fruits and take them into the temple and wave those in the temple as a symbol that they came from God, they were blessings from God, and that if there were first fruits, there would be more to come. There would be a full harvest. So he was waving his first fruit to say that he's dedicating that to God. So we're, when we're saved, we are first fruits. That's what the Bible says about us as Christians. We are the first fruits. And so if we're first fruits, then we should be waving our lives before God and saying we are completely dedicated because that's what James is talking about. It's an act of consecration. The greatest gift we give back to God is our own life. For him giving us all these wonderful gifts, every good and perfect gift comes from him, we give back the gift of our own lives. In, in Matthew, the sixth chapter, it's interesting that uh, the Lord, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer, or the, I said the disciples' prayer, Jesus said, Lord, bring us, that's direction, bring us, and then deliverance, Lord, deliver us, and then the divine dynamic to overcome the temptation, what is that? For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And so we have talked then about growing uh, or grumbling, gaining victory over temptation. Uh, now we want to talk about grasping the truths of God's word and applying those. Look in verses 19 and 20. If we want to do all these things that James has taught us to do, we've got to get it from where? From the scripture. And here's what we do. We first of all got to hear it. My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. More than three quarters of Americans, 77%, uh, think the nation's morality is headed downhill, according to a Barna study. 
about 88% of the respondents said they own the Bible. Uh, I think uh, something like 80% think the Bible is sacred. 61% wish they read the Bible more. 4.4 Bibles per household in this country today, but only 26% of Americans read the Bible regularly. And we have James, no wonder we're failing tests. You know, we haven't read the textbook. <laughs> how, how much luck would you have in a class in the university? You never open the textbook, you just go and sit and soak and sour. And then you go home and you take, or you go, go back and take the test. When you go back and take the test, you have no clue because you didn't read the test. You don't know what, the professor didn't cover it all in the class. You gotta do some reading on your own. And so James says, you gotta hear it. Here's how you, here's how you hear it. First of all, by being ready. Verse 19, my dear little brothers understand this. Everyone must be quick, ready to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So be quick to hear. Uh, you, you've heard the old proverb that that's probably the reason why that God gave us two ears and one tongue, so that we'd be quick to listen. He's given us the ability to listen in stereo and talk in mono, and we need to listen twice as much at least as we speak. Uh, I've, I've, I've said that uh, uh, we're, we're to listen and be ready to listen, which is what, to be ready to do so. That's what James said. Uh, and so, Listen, less than 20% of Christians say that they go to church regularly. If we, we, go to, we come to church, we sit and listen to uh, 30 minutes of teaching, perhaps, if, unless we come to life group and service, then we listen to a combination of maybe 60 or 70 minutes of teaching on Sunday morning. Um, we, we, most of us don't have any trouble with listening. You know, we'll <laughs> flippantly listen, a little passively listen, not actively listen many times. As long as the preacher doesn't preach about our sin, we're all right. Now, if he starts talking about something that's going on with us, we get, oh, you know, we say, wait, goodness, it looks like the thing is going to be an hour long because he's talking about us today. We'll sit, but do we really hear? James says we got to be ready to hear. We need to be ready to listen when the word is hard to hear. And then he says this. He says we need to be slow to speak. That's how important what we say is. We give all kinds of excuses the unvarnished truth. Billy Graham said when he was asked, what is the truth? He said, the truth is just the bare, naked, unashamed truth. Just tell the truth. And so the teaching is we shouldn't speak too quickly. We ought to be slow to speak. That's the word for restraint. For restraint. And we need to learn to press in the clutch on our tongues and let our minds catch up and compute a better answer before we answer them any time. We're so quick to fire back the word. Um, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. One who controls his lips is wise. Solomon in Proverbs 10, 19. And in Proverbs 21, 23, the one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. You, you heard the illustration of the story of the lady who came to her pastor. She was confessing, said, I, you know, I've just been angry with a lot of people. I've mistreated a lot of people in the community. And I just am feeling horribly about it. I just want to deal with it. How can I deal with it? Get this off my conscience. He said, take a ba bag of feathers, down feathers, and go around and put one on each doorstep of every person you've offended. So she took it and was gone for a week or so, placed a feather, came back, she had an empty bag. She said, Preacher, I've done that, but I still feel horrible. And he said, well, that's because you haven't finished the, you haven't finished the, the uh, challenge yet. You've got to go back now and pick them up. And on the day she, he gave her the bag back, said, go back and pick all them up. She walked out, and the day she went out, the wind was blowing. She searched and searched and searched for a long time. She finally came back and brought back the empty bag, and she said, I couldn't retreat a single one of them. And he says, that's the way it is with your words. When you spill out your words, mm -hmm. and you can never take them back. So we need to be careful. We're pressing mm -hmm. the clutch. And she dumped out what she couldn't take back in. We dump out sometimes what we can't take back. Now, notice he says, be reluctant. And this is talking about anger here. And this, I mean, James just does not preach. He meddles. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> you know, because anger means rage or animosity. And so James says, here's the rule. Be slow to anger, for man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Thomas Manton says, anger groweth not by stages, but at first she is in full growth. And so James doesn't say we're not to be angry uh, at all. He says we're to be slow to be angry. We are to have a godly anger against sin. We should hate the sin, but love the sinner, always. Paul says in Ephesians 4.26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. We're not to possess rage. We're not to let it build up inside of us. 
because anger blocks our ability to hear God speaking to us. He's trying to teach us through his word, but we, we can't hear that because we can't keep our mouths shut long enough to listen to God. We get into his presence. Have you noticed how your prayer life is almost all monologue talking to God and very little dialogue? We, you know, what I have learned in retirement, because I struggled with that always the pastor, I was so busy and I was preparing messages and doing counseling sessions, doing the hospital, doing funerals, doing weddings, all those things. And when I got into retirement, I've learned how now to sit down and read the Bible and pray and meditate and listen to God. And it's amazing what God will say to you if you listen to him. It's amazing to, to, to me how he will speak to us, not only through his word, but many other ways we wouldn't even imagine that he would speak to us. And so he says that, that when we become angry, have an anger against sin, but anger blocks our ability to hear God speaking. And if we're not, if we just harbor that, then we'll shut the word out. So he says, first of all, then, that we are to hear the word. And then notice next, he says in verse 21, we're to heed the word. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. Now, I want you to notice how he says we're to do this. First of all, we're to remove something. Rid yourself of something. What is he, say, is he says we're to? He says we're to rid ourselves. The word he uses is pos, which means all. He says, rid yourself of all, every single one of the evil things, and he uses the word ruparia there, which is uh, moral filth or evil, evil things. In fact, the best definition I've seen of moral filth is that moral filth is literally wax from the ear. Too much wax in the ear interferes with our hearing. So James says, get the wax out of the ear. How do we get the wax out of our ears? By removing the moral filth. Now the word he uses there is kakia, but for evil, which is mean. He says, root out the excess of sin. Because we'll do small things, but we let sins become bigger things. The sin grows. The sin, the sin uh, expands on us if we don't deal with it. And so he says the, the, that if you sin and you, you, you sear the conscience, you're going to sin again and sin again. And the more you sin, the less you're convicted, and after a while, consciousness just kind of seared, and if conscience doesn't bother you anymore, that's when you're in a dangerous, dangerous position before God. So remove something, then receive something. Receive the implanted word which is in you. And that's the picture there of a host welcoming someone into their home. Receive the word of God into your life just like you'd welcome someone into your home, James says. And the object of our reception is to be the word of God. Take the whole counsel of the scripture, study it all, let it sink down deep into your heart. This is the only time by the word, that, by the way, that this word, uh, the implanted word, the use here for implanted word, is a horticultural term to implant. The only time it's used in the New Testament. It, it's used of a seed being planted in the ground that begins to germinate. And the only way we can live and please God is to let the gardener, who is the Holy Spirit, implant the word and then it begins to grow in us. And it grows in us through all those stages of life. I want to give them, give them to you because I know the whole thing about regeneration, sanctification, glorification, those three things, those are theological terms. I want to give them to you in a, in a simpler way to understand. We have salvation in possession, that is the new birth. We already have that. So that's not what James is talking about here. We have salvation in progress, which is the sanctification thing we talked about. That's the work of the Holy Spirit cutting off the rough edges of our lives. We have salvation in prospect, which is heaven that we'll have after this life. And so what is he talking about? When he's talking about here about uh, our receiving the implanting word, that's the work of the Holy Spirit that's going on right now in the interim between our being born again and our being glorified in heaven with Christ when he comes. And so in the interim time, Paul says this, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, the call according to his purpose. Those he foreknew would come to him in Christ. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's what James is talking about. That God is sending these tests to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. And so we are then to receive then the implanted word. And then we're to remember something. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. We're to pay attention to God's word. Not just hear it and receive it. But we're to remember, we're to keep the word in mind so we apply it in our lives. I need to hear the word on Sunday so I'll apply it Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, during the course of the week. So we're to hear the word and heed the word. Then in the last section of the chapter, verses 22 through 27, he says we're to honor the word of God. Now this is not a fiction novel. This is not a short story. 
that I hold in my hand here. This is a book of God's word to us. And if you look at this book, you know that you've got to avoid a casual glance. And that's the first thing he says. Be doers of the word, not ears only. Deceiving yourselves, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man looking at his own face in the mirror, looks at himself, goes away immediately, forgets what kind of man he was. And so we, we go to church and we listen to people talk about the Bible, and we think, boy, I've listened to a lot of people. I, talk, I listened to the life group teacher today. I listened to the Sunday school teacher and whatever. I listened to the pastor today. And boy, I listen to somebody else on TV this afternoon, some televangelist or whoever, and, and we fool ourselves. We think, well, I know a lot about the Bible because I just got a lot of Bible, man, all day Sunday. I don't know, you know, no. Look, we deceive ourselves and we think we have a lot of the Bible by listening to other people. We think we're growing spiritually by hearing people talk about the Bible. So James said, and, and here's a, let me give, give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Um, I went over to the gym, as I said a while ago, to work out this morning. Now, if you were at the gym working out, and you saw me say, all of you were at the gym working out, and I come in, and I sit down with a bag of Tostitos, <laughs> and in my folding chair, and I eat the whole bag of Tostitos, and I drink my sugar-filled drink, and I crumple it up and throw it away, and I say, wow, wasn't that a great workout? <laughs> you look at me, you bad. there's something a little strange about that, right? Because <laughs> you're not going to gain, any, you're not going to gain any mass. You're not going to be able to beef yourself up. You're not getting stronger by doing that. So <clears throat> James says, reading, and hearing somebody else talk about the Bible is like watching somebody else work out. Hearing somebody else talk about it is not going to grow you up in the faith. You have got to hear the word and then apply the word in all these ways that he's talked about here. And in fact, here's, here's, I want to put a challenge in front of you. Notice that, that you need to put, a, that you, I think you're going to have in your notes here in a moment. We should say after Bible study, based on that teaching, I will do. What are you going to do about what you learned? Sunday morning in the class, Sunday morning in the service. <clears throat> By the way, way, the letter I is extremely important in that statement. You leave church on Sunday morning. How many times have you said, Boy, I should talk to your wife on the way to the car. Boy, I sure wish so and so had been here this morning to hear that. <laughs> they should have been here today to hear that. We always think it's about somebody else. Uh, but it, we can't just hear it. James says we've got to honor the word. If we don't, we're like a guy who looks in the mirror in the morning and he sees himself unshaved and he sees his hair all to, in a state of disarray. And he goes to, to, he puts on his clothes, goes to work, and when he walks into work, he looks like an accident that already happened because he didn't do anything about what he saw in the mirror. James says the Bible is a mirror. So I want you to, to, to see this. The Bible has a mirror ministry because it shows us as we really are. We look in the Bible, the Bible is a mirror that reads out to us <clears throat> who we are. Every mirror that you'll see, we, we just hung on a new mirror and, a, and an optional uh, bath that we finished in the home that we live in and hung a mirror in there the other day. <clears throat> we look in that mirror. I'll tell you one thing about that mirror. The mirror doesn't lie. Uh, there are three char characteristics of the mirror. It doesn't lie, it doesn't play favorites, and it doesn't worry about feelings. It just puts it back on you. Now, I remember a few years ago I had a photographer here that was, uh, that was a young lady, a just fantastic person, did a photo shoot for me uh, for the book I was doing, and, and so we, we did the thing at Omaha College, and, and of course she was shooting all these things, and she said, we got through it. She said, now, now, you know, I'm not like some photographers. I'm not going to touch it all up. She said, I'm going to make, make a few adjustments here and there, but said, I want, I want you to be believable. And I said, that's exactly what I want. I don't want a picture of me that looks like 20 years ago. You see, a, a mirror doesn't do that for you. A, a, a professional photographer can take your picture and clean you up and make you look like you have no wrinkles. I saw, I saw a picture of a lady the other day on Facebook that was at least 25 years younger than I, and I know her to be, and I know her really well. And I told my wife, I said, do you believe that? <laughs> And the picture was just taken, and somebody went on there, why don't you tell us where you found the fountain of youth? Because it, it, when you read the Bible, we need to see ourselves like we're looking in the mirror. We need to see ourselves exactly as God sees us, because the book is a mirror for us to look into. Verse 25, accomplish a careful gaze, he says. Uh, we avoid a casual glance. Do more than that. Gaze into the Scripture. One who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and, per and perseveres in it, and is, and is not forget, a forgetful here, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So James gives us the remedy for the casual glance, and that is a careful gaze. 
Parakupto is the Greek word. It means to intently look at something, to stoop down is what it means. To get, it's, it's the same word used of John, when Peter and John went to the open <coughs> tomb, and John stooped down and looked into the grave. And so that's what the scripture says. James says we're to gaze, we're to stoop down and look carefully at what the Bible says to us and learn what it says. And then God wants us to be doers of the word, discerners of the word, disciples of the word, so that we hear it, and then not only are we blessed because we've heard it, but we begin to do it. Avoid the casual glance, accomplish a, a careful gaze, and then apply God's word in your life. A couple of things he says we do to accomplish that. Verses 26 and 27, if anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, meddling again, obviously, uh, he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. And so he says we apply God's word, first of all, in our conversation, in the words that we use. He's already addressed speech. Now he says if we don't get a hold on it, we got to get a hold of our tongues, control our tongue. He uses a long Greek term, Sholinagogeo is the term. That's a long term. Sholinagogeo. It means to bridle. And the picture is just as a horse trainer seeks to control a horse with the aid of a bridle, we're to bridle our tongues. And he says, if you don't put a bridle on your tongue, you're deceiving yourself. This goes again to anger, but not only anger, but doing what with the anger? Open your mouth and removing all doubt, right? <laughs> because you dump it on somebody. Uh, look at the 2016 presidential campaign, for example. Have you noticed that there is a lot of, uh, well, I, I don't really know how to describe that, and I don't want to get into that because it will take us all night long to even try to get our hands around that. But I can tell you this, we cheat ourselves and we have a worthless and empty religion if we don't learn how to control our tongues, we, how to deal with our conversation. And some of the politicians today need to learn how to control their conversation. Both parties about to blow themselves up and implode because they don't know how to control their tongues. And so we need to get a, learn a lesson from that and then concern.